today we will have one of the nicest uh, lectures in this course it's my favorite topic in this course because today we are going to start learning about uh, development economics in itself and uh, this is a very a very important uh, field for our course in global political economy because our course discusses how development affects international relations international cooperation and international conflict and we need to understand development in order to understand international relations today i would like to talk to you about a friend of mine his name is Arthur Lewis. And then let me show you a picture of him. Can you see him? Arthur Lewis. Yeah. Okay. Arthur Lewis was a child in St. Lucia. You know where St. Lucia is? St. Lucia is there in the Caribbean, right? I think it's close to Colombia. It's an island, right? In the Caribbean, St. Lucia. It was a colony, British colony. And he was born there in a family In that poor country and when he was seven years old his father died and he had many other brothers and sisters his elder brother was 17 other smaller one was five i think i don't remember exactly but it was a large family five brothers or sisters i think and arthur lewis was a very good student at school. He was really good student. He was very clever. He was a gifted student there, a pupil at school, right? He was so good that his teachers had to promote him two years. So he finished school at the age of 14 because he was so good that his teachers he they let him pass two courses two years and uh, he finished school at 14 and when he finished school he was so young that he could not go to university or anything or apply for a scholarship because he was so young so he started working at the age of 14 right but he started working but his intention was to prepare himself uh, for the uh, examinations for the competition for scholarships to be able to go to university and he there were scholarships of the government of saint lucia to go to university in britain so when he had the age he took the competition and he got the scholarship and he went to study at the London School of Economics at my school as well where I studied right and there he was also a very good student yes he was not like the other students he studied their Bachelor of Commerce it's like studying business administration right and he uh, initially he wanted to be an engineer but he knew that nobody would hire him as an engineer in his country because at the moment there was like uh, you know they had like uh, racist uh, problems in this country and he knew as an engineer he would not get a job 
in the government or in a firm in his country and that's why he studied instead he studied business right and he studied at the LSE and he was such a good student that when he finished his studies they told him that he had to stay there to study for a PhD to study for a doctorate and he studied for a doctorate there and because he was such a good student in the doctorate his teachers recommended him to become a teacher there at the London School of Economics and he became a teacher there as well and today at this London School of Economics they are very proud of him why are they so proud of him that they were the first university who accepted him in the UK and the first university where he became a teacher because in the year 1979 he won the Nobel Prize in economics and he won this prize because he developed not only a model that explains economic development he developed the first such model in this new field of economists interested about the economy of developing countries and he became like the father of the field of development economics Right? He was a, a PhD student and a teacher at the LSE and then his first job at the age of 33 or so as a full professor at the University of Manchester in the UK. And there at, the, at this university is where he's developed this model, this dual sector model. It's also called the Lewis model that we will discuss today. Later then he would go to be a professor at the University of Princeton in the United States. Right? But so th this is just like some introduction so that you know who we are talking about. We are talking about, about Sir Arthur Lewis. Sir Arthur Lewis, the father of development economics, the author of the Lewis model, the author of the dual sector model that we will study today, and the, the, the initiator of this field thanks to which we can have this course today. Arthur Lewis, an orphan, whose father died when he was seven in a very poor country, St. Lucia in a British colony that went to the UK and he was the first black student to be admitted there and the first black teacher at the university and he won the Nobel Prize in economics and he created a new field of development economics so we are not talking about anyone we are talking about a very important person sir arthur lewis okay good lewis created a model trying to explain uh, economic development with an economy that has two sectors one of those sectors he called it the subsistence sector and the other sector he called it the capitalist sector of the economy he said in an economy we can divide people into two sectors a subsistence one which is usually in rural areas where people just work to survive where do, they do not produce for the market, where they produce 
for self subsistence where they produce and uh, with a semi communist system in which the production the whole production of the family they divide it among all the members of the family and it doesn't matter how much you produce but if you are a member of the family you receive your part of the family production it does not matter if you are really needed there what you contribute to production because in a family everyone gets a share of the production and this is how he described what happened in the rural areas of developing countries like the one where he came from in Saint Lucia right so the, he called this the subsistence sect but he said that in his country and in developing countries this subsistence sector coexists with a modern advanced sector that is guided by capitalist rules in which people work and get paid for the contribution they make to the production of the firm they get paid as a function of the marginal product of their work unlike in the subsistence sector where they get paid the average production not the marginal one these are two concepts in economics for those who study the economics you understand the difference between the average pro uh, product or the marginal product in a capitalist society a firm will only hire you if you have added value for the firm if you will increase the firm's productivity whereas in the subsistence sector you will be a member of the family even if you do not contribute to the total output if there are more members of the family but they have the same number of tools and the same surface of land they will just share the work between the members of the family they will not say we will fire you from the family because we don't no longer need you because we don't have land for everyone no in a family you share right if one additional member for the same amount of work so we just divide the current work among the members of the family in the capitalist system it's different so what Lewis said is that this difference what it meant is that in the subsistence sector in the rural sector there was surplus labor there were too many workers in the poor rural areas that had this subsistence system there were more workers than were needed in those areas because if there was one surplus worker it was no problem they would not let him or her die they would just share what they produced and the work they have but he said that this difference is also what allowed him to explain economic development as the transformation of a country by the migration of people from the backward subsistence rural sector of the economy to the more modern capitalist advanced sector usually in the in the urban areas so he said in this model that there was surplus labor too many people in the rural areas that they were not contributing to production even if people migrated to the city the rural production would not decrease 
So this movement of people from the rural areas to the urban areas, this process of urbanization, which is something that usually happens with economic development, was how he explained this transformation that we call economic development, right? It's through migration from the subsistence sector to the capitalist sector of the economy. In many developing countries of the world, they have this duality. If you go to Libya, right, you will have rural areas with people that live just to survive in the agricultural sector, in a subsistence sector, just to survive. And you will have also cities with firms and with modern economy according to capitalist standards. And the same happens in many developing countries. In Egypt, in Morocco, even in Brazil, it happens. This duality between a subsistence sector of the economy and then you go to Sao Paulo and you see there the big corporations, the good jobs with very good conditions, with higher wages because they have higher productivity. Right? So Luis was the first one that developed this dual sector model of the economy. And this model has been very, very, very influential for understanding the process of economic development. An economic development that is through this migration of people and the reduction of the subsistence sector of the economy and the increase of the modern capitalist sector that is usually in urban areas. Right? And I, I, I like this model very much because when I was in Brazil, when I was younger and so on, and also or with my cousins, they told me, you know, Brazil is like two different countries in the same territory, right? It's like a very advanced country, more advanced than Spain, like a European country. And then a very backward country, like an African country, living in the same territory. This duality. At the moment, I did not understand very well why it was like that. But now I understand it. Because this is very common in many other countries that are in the process of developing. And this transformation, the development, which means this migration of people, that the backward sector shrinks and the advanced modern sector grows. Many policymakers in many countries have asked themselves, okay, we have this Lewis model, we understand now why we are backward because we have this subsistence sector that is unproductive and very big and we have very small modern sector in the cities. And these policymakers, they say, let's promote economic development by encouraging people to leave the rural areas and to go to the modern urban areas. And this was the case also in Romania, for instance, with Ceausescu, right? In Romania with Ceausescu, he as a policymaker, he was the, the leader of Romania for many, for many years, for 25 years or so, right? 
from 65 to 90 I think. 89 89 and he promoted the migration of people from the rural areas into the cities he built apartment blocks he built factories he built things and he encouraged people to leave the rural areas and to go to the more modern areas because he followed this model this Lewis model says that even if people leave the rural areas there will be no loss of agricultural production because the model expects that in, ru in rural areas there's an excess of labor there are too many workers they are unproductive workers and when they go to the city they are more productive so some countries believe that pushing people away from rural areas will help the countries develop and they promote policies for urbanization they use government money for building cities and factories and where do they get this government money from the rural areas because in an economy you remember from Robinson Crusoe another friend of mine in a closed economy like Robin Crusoe what you get you have to take it from somewhere else for Robin Crusoe it was very easy if you get something if you get uh, sticks for uh, making tools you will not spend them uh, burning them for fire right in an economy as a whole with two sectors if you promote the cities where do you get the money to promote the cities? Not from the cities itself, because then it's no promotion. You get it from the rural areas. So this is some developing development policy in some countries that follow this model. It's trying to tax the rural areas and subsidize the urban areas to encourage the movement of people from rural to urban areas okay this is, is the... this uh, sorry professor is yes. this a good example uh, turkey i think it's a, it's a better example than Armenia. yes probably uh, you know many many developing countries are, do this you know like uh, when they develop and sometimes when they have governments that want to promote uh, Romania now it's not the example because Romania now this leader that did this policy he was killed by his own population and the many people who were in the urban areas went back to the rural areas afterwards right they undid what he tried to push people away from rural areas and then they came back okay but in, in turkey they still have a government that still has its own development policy i'm not very familiar with turkey but probably yes they do that many many countries they that have leaders that believe in this model and they 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 try to accelerate economic development by pushing people from rural to urban areas right the Lewis model is not necessarily a prescriptive model about what you should do the Lewis model is something that explains development by this movement of people from one sector to another but of course this model can be used by policy makers to get ideas okay if if the movement of people from the backward sector to the modern one is what drives development why not accelerating this by pushing people away from rural areas 
it's a very influential model i like it very much the lewis model it's a dual sector model but today in this lecture we will also learn another model which is called the harris todaro model which is not a dual sector model it is a three sector model because in this model there's not just the poor rural areas and the rich urban areas there's something in between that is called urban unemployment or urban poverty what in brazil they call it favelas right and in many developing countries it exists in india yes it's true in new delhi they have very great corporations very good jobs very important firms in it in in other sectors in industry right but they also have many poor people they have slums right like favelas in brazil and in this aristodaro model they explain this urban unemployment which is initially a paradox it's a paradox because you say okay people voluntarily they move from the rural areas into the urban areas but many of those who go to the urban areas they end up living there in worse conditions than they had in the rural areas where they came from this is a paradox why do they migrate to live in worse conditions than in their region of origin it's a paradox and this Harris Todaro model explains why and he explains why because he says when people migrate it's like a lottery it's like a gamble they go to the urban areas where there are very good jobs and they are also people who are unlucky who are unemployed or who have to work in the informal economy without a minimum wage without social insurance without uh, schooling and so on yes the informal economy but when they migrate they migrate because of the expectations that they have they know it's a gamble but it's a gamble worth taking they say there are 50 percent chances that i get a good job 50% chances that I end up living under a bridge. But the good job is so good that it compensates so that the gamble is worth taking. So I migrate anyway. And some of those who migrate anyway are lucky and they get the good jobs with the uh, official wages with social security in good firms good capitalist firms and other people end up living in a favela and working without minimum wage without social security without uh, worker protection of any kind uh, in domestic service or in uh, or just they are unemployed and they just have to eat what they find on the street or or in prostitution or in something bad 
So this Aristotle model explains this phenomenon called urban poverty, urban unemployment. And this is an excellent model because uh, at a certain point in a city, I don't remember what the city was. Ah, yes, I think it was in Nairobi. Do you know the city of Nairobi, Johan? Excuse me, sir. Do you know Nairobi? Yes, sir. I know Nairobi. Where is it? In Kenya? Uh, Nairobi is an African country. Yes. I don't know very much about African geography. I think Nairobi is the capital of Kenya, but I may be wrong, right? Haida, do you, do you yes, know? Sir. Yeah, I think it's uh, the capital of Kenya as well. Okay, it's for sure. Yes, good. So in Nairobi, what they had is this phenomenon. In the city of Nairobi, they had good jobs. They had uh, firms, multinational firms, modern firms, capitalist firms with social security, with minimum wage, with all good conditions. But they also had many people in the city that were unemployed. And the government had an idea. We have to fight this urban unemployment. How can we do this, Haida? And they said, let's create more jobs for these unemployed people. It makes sense, right, Haida? Good idea. If you have unemployed people in Nairobi, let's create jobs for all of them to absorb all those unemployed people. And the government of Kenya did that and they created jobs for the unemployed people of Nairobi. And do you know what happened, Haida? No, sir. Do you know, Ariana, what happened? No. What happened is that this policy backfired because the number of unemployed people in Nairobi grew instead of decreasing. They created more jobs to absorb the unemployed people. And another paradox happened. The number of unemployed people instead of being reduced when they created more jobs for them, the number of unemployed people grew. Why was that? Because when they created more jobs to absorb those unemployed people, now the gamble of migrating to Nairobi was a better conditions than before. There were more jobs there compared to the number of unemployed people. So more people from the rural areas migrated to Nairobi. This is really nice. The Haris Todaro model. Todaro, I think, is Indian. Right? Louis from St. Lucia, Todaro in India. See, our, our uh, teachers in this course are really good ones, very international. But who would think this, you know? That the government of Kenya says, there are many unemployed people in Nairobi, let's create more jobs in Nairobi for these people. And the number of unemployed people grew instead of decreasing. Now we understand why. Because of the Harris Todaro model that explains that migrating is a gamble. And if you improve the conditions of the gamble, if you change the probability of being employed and employed, more people will take their chance and migrate. Understood, Catalin? Yes. Good. 
because now because our course you remember the title of our course our course is titled global political economy okay so what we will do now is to try to apply this harris todaro model and this lewis model to explain the economy of the world of the globe yes and in the globe there is also like a dual sector model with one sector of the global economy that is very modern capitalist advanced with good wages with good conditions and there's another sector of the global economy that is rural subsistence that is poor and development can also happen by the shrinking the subsistence sector and increasing the capitalist one and this can be done by migration of people from the backward system to the modern one but because we also know the harris todaro model we know that there are not just two sectors there's three sectors there's one in between the people who migrate but do not land the good jobs right and they end up unemployed they end up living living in a favela or they end up uh, prostituting themselves or they end up in poorly paid jobs you know like cleaning cleaning houses or something part-time and bad jobs or they are just temporary workers for agriculture yes there's this sector that we can call it urban poverty or urban unemployment but now because we are talking about the globe let's call this sector illegal migration many people migrate from africa to europe for instance because they want to have better conditions than in their countries of origin and some people make it and they really get better conditions they get asylum they get the papers they get jobs in good firms and so on but other people migrate but never get the good jobs never get the papers never get the good working conditions that they dreamed of like the people that migrated from the countryside of kenya to nairobi right this that encouraged the creation of the harris todaro model like the government of nairobi of or of kenya we can think how can we solve now the problem with these illegal migrants in europe many illegal migrants they do not have good jobs they do not have the um, papers they do not have uh, work permits and so on how can we solve this very easy the initial reaction is let's give them the work permits let's create jobs for them let's give them jobs let's give them work permits and jobs and we ended up the problem of the migrant poverty ah but we know what happens in the harris todaro model we know what happened in nairobi 
when they did this. When you give the jobs, you give the social security, you give the good conditions for the illegal migrants, then this encourages more migrants to come. Because now the gamble has changed. It's better gamble now and more come. And you are the leader of the country and you say, but I had good intentions. I had in my country one million illegal immigrants and I created one million jobs and I gave one million work permits. And now I see that the next year, instead of having one million poor people, migrants, I have, to, I have two million. The Harris to Dar model. You see? So we started in St. Lucia with my friend Arthur Lewis, the dual sector model. We explained how the developing countries are usually more rural with subsistence economy in many places, how the process, the transformation of development is the shrinking of the rural sector, the growing of the capitalist one. We explained the economic policies to promote development in some countries. We explain how in some countries the government tried to accelerate this process by pushing people away from rural areas into urban ones. We discussed as well the problem with urban unemployment and poverty that we see in Sao Paulo, in Rio de Janeiro. Sao Paulo, Rio de Janeiro, they have very good jobs, very good firms there, but they also have the favelas. Let's create jobs and good conditions for the people, all the people in the favelas. Yes, you do this this year, because next year you will have twice as many people living in the favelas, because more will come. Migration as a gamble, as a lottery, Right? So that's why it makes it so difficult, Haida. It makes it so difficult for European leaders when they say, okay, but we have here this humanitarian problem. We have 1,000 migrants that they are caught here in bad conditions. And so what do we do with them? It would be so easy to give them Asylum and, and jobs just for those people? But what would happen next month? That the problem would be twice as serious. Let's discuss about this because I like having so good students. What do you think about this, Haida? Did you know this model, the Harris Todaro model? Um, no. But you studied at La Hawaiian University in Ifram. This uh, is I the best, took, uh, the best I university took, in Africa. Uh, I only took introduction to economics. I haven't gone uh, in depth. Mm -hmm. You know, this university is so good. I have to tell you, Catalin, you cannot imagine. It's a different league. It's like 10 times better than the University of Suchawa, right? And this, mm -hmm. in this university, uh, I, I organized a summer school for several years in Spain, and I had hundreds of students from Alahawain. Yes? 
and they were very very good you know very very good students very all of them they were very very bright and and the very uh, cult cultivated students you know like really really good students it was like it's like an american university in africa right and um, for sure haida if you took the right courses there maybe in f future years in different levels i'm sure this university discusses this uh, these kinds of problems but you don't need it now because you are in this course of the eurosci network and we discuss it here now right with Catalin and with Ariana and with Sofia and uh, with Abel and with Zeina and with Yogo, with Nora, right? With your colleagues. But I would like to discuss with you about this. What do you think about this problem with migration from Africa to Europe? How could it be solved? Um. I did study something similar about uh, the problems of Africa and Europe because of the push and pull effect of uh, immigration. Um, I think it's because there is nothing for the migrants to pull them to stay in their countries. Uh, and it's pushing them away to live in Europe for a better life because Europe makes it seem like it's, uh, um, well, it is obviously more developed than most uh, yes. African countries. Yes, so essentially what drives migration is the way, the, the wedge, is the gap between Europe and Africa in the standard of living people want a better living right and as long as you maintain this wedge this gap between the development of europe and africa there will always be migration there will always be people wanting to migrate right so how can you reduce this migration problem this problem with illegal migrants you cannot solve it just by creating more work permits for them and they are not illegal any, anymore and you solve it no because we know from the harris todaro model that this can aggrav aggravate the problem more that will come so that's a very good point haida that the only solution if you want to end the urban unemployment in Nairobi the only way is on the one hand yes create more jobs in the city but on the other hand also create more better jobs in the rural areas and if you pull uh, you what you call push pull yeah I I think I understood something like this right that you if you want to solve the problem of migration, you will need to improve the conditions in Africa. So, yes. For me, uh, there's many factors. Yes. Because um, we have the inequality in the country between rich people and poor people. Rich people have more opportunities than poor people, so I think that uh, poor people can take the decision to go to another countries like Europe, USA, or Morocco, Morocco for call center, for example. So, for the solution, we, we can develop some employment. <laughs> voilà. Um, and um, that's it yes I think it's a very good point that uh, 
And this is in line with what we discussed. You said that there's inequality in the countries of origin and that the people that migrate, they are not the successful people in their own country. They are the people who come from the poor sector of their country, right? But this is in line with Louis' model of development. If we managed the good sector of the Senegal economy to grow compared to the poor sector of the economy, we would reduce the number of people that are forced to migrate. But this would mean the development of Senegal according to this Lewis model of growing the number of people in the good sector of the economy. Because in Senegal, I'm sure, like in many uh, developing countries, there are also two sectors of the economy. Not everyone is poor there. Right? How is it in, in, in Morocco? Is there anyone from Morocco here? I don't think so, right? Bamogo, where are you from, Bamogo? Are you there, Bamogo? Present, sir. Yes, where are you from, Bamogo? I come from Burkina Faso. In Burkina Faso. There is, yes. is, uh, the, are there good jobs in the cities of Burkina Faso? Or everyone is poor in Burkina Faso? I not understand, sir. Mm -hmm. How about how about Gabon? Because Gabon is a very successful country. It's like a mid middle income country. What happens in Gabon, Yuan? Yuan is not there. Yuan. Yes, yes. Yes. In in Gabon, you're from Gabon, right? Yes. Are there differences between the rural areas and the urban areas of Gabon? Are the urban areas more developed than the rural areas? Um, the rural areas, please, uh, uh, what means um, rural area? The countryside, oh. the agricultural, the people, is the, the people in the cities are more developed than the people in the countryside? Okay, sir. Uh, yes, sir. Um, people, um, people in people in Gabonese cities um, have um, yes, they have a, be a better living than um, people in in the countryside. Good, good, Johan, thank you. So this more or less it's, uh, confirms the, the this idea, right? Mm, professor, I yes. have something in my mind. Yes. I, want, I, I want to ask you. I'm wondering if uh, the rich countries have uh, benefits or advantages yes. from this uh, uh, phen phenomenon from the illegal migration. Yes, yes, of course, yes. In the... Um, uh, some, some people ask, you know, why in the uh, city of Nairobi, why if there are some people unemployed, why don't they reduce the uh, the wages for the people employed and hire the unemployed people, right? And why there's this difference between the employed and unemployed? Why the employed people earn so much and the unemployed people so little, right? What's the purpose of that? And there's this idea, this is called the 
efficiency wage. In the efficiency wage, it tells you that sometimes it's useful that your workers, you pay them more than you could pay. Maybe you could get cheaper workers if you hired the unemployed people, but it's better to have them well paid. And it's better that they are well paid and that they see that other people are unemployed. Instead of having everyone unemployed with a medium wage. Why is it better? Because like that they will work harder. Because they will know. I am very lucky, have very good conditions, very good job. If I do not work hard and I lose my job, I will be like this other person who is unemployed. So the, the same thing can happen, you know, with illegal uh, migration and so on. You know, this is something that forces people also to, to work harder, right? We agree that the, um, the first, the illegal migration can be an advantage for the rich country where the people migrate also. Because the rich country wants some cheaper workers, they can cover some uh, lack of, uh, I don't know, people which are uh, uh, agree to do some dirty yes, jobs, yes, or yes. hard jobs. Yes. Yes. Like, uh, but they will, uh, that will. We lo they will only agree to do those jobs while they are illegal. Yes. And, and if they give them the work permits and the uh, asylum status and so on, they will no longer want to do those jobs. They will want the good jobs. Yes, because the, the, these uh, work permits uh, usually are not given Quickly, you know. Exactly. You it takes, the, 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 many uh, years. Takes many yes. years. Yes, and uh, maybe after a, a, few, a few exams or uh, uh, after you demonstrate that you are able to to have this uh, work permission. I have. Um, um, but I it's have a, a it's a balance. What you have to understand, Bogdan, that this is the balance that you have to get, because. If you say, I will give the papers to everyone, I will give the, the working rights to everyone. But then you realize that by doing that, you just encourage more migrants to come. And you didn't solve the initial problem that you wanted to solve. You said, I want to reduce the inequality by creating better conditions for the immigrants, right? But after you do that and you create better conditions for those immigrants, more immigrants come and the same problem of inequality that you had before, you still have it, but larger. That's why our science, the economics, it's called the dismal science. It's like it's it's like a very sad science right because it's in, it's a science where you you realize that nothing is for free that uh, everything that you want to solve can make something else worse and that's always impossible to achieve the utopian world that you like in economy, you have to make choices, right? And you have to, you, you choose something and you give up something else, always, right? You said, I answered this question. Can I answer also the other one with the points I have? No, if you want the chocolate ice cream, you cannot have the strawberry one. You have to choose. In the economy, it's the same. If you want to have a country with a high standard of living, right? 
You cannot have it at the same time being a country that lets all the migrants in. Because they will come and come and come until the situation in their country of origin equalizes with yours. Do you want Romania to be like Egypt? Or you want Romania to be like Sudan? Or you want Romania to be like Ghana? No, you don't. I don't know. So then you have to... It, it's very difficult for you to make a policy. How, how do I deal with this? And now you see the situation in Belarus. All these migrants, right? From Africa and Belarus, and you look at them. And you look at the uh, small children there. You look that it's very cold there. That there are people dying there. And unless you are a heartless person, you care about those people. Yes? But then after you care, and they ask you, okay, Bogdan, my leader, my, my prime minister or my president, what shall we do with these people? Okay, you say, it's just a, a few thousand people. Let's take them in, right? And the next month, you have twice as many understand and that's why our course in a way is a sad course right because being scientific being economic it tells you you know when you get something you have to give up something else you cannot have everything at the same time. You want to have fraternity with these people? You want, okay, let's equalize the standard of living of Europe with the standard of living of Africa. And we create something in the middle. Do you want that? Um, <clears throat> Some professor. people may want it. Yes. Um, I would like to add something to this topic. Yes. Uh, like some rich countries can get big advantages from immigration. For example, uh, in Turkey, there were a lot of immigrants from Syria, and Turkey took them um, like in a purpose because Turkey get money for uh, for these immigrations from yes. the Europe. Yes. not to spread these uh, Syrian immigrants in the Europe. So, um, and even there were really big protests in Turkey from their own country, like from own citizens that against uh, Syrians. So they don't want that much immigrants in their country, but they are really a lot and they are illegal. And that's why like yes. some countries are getting money for that for yes what what happens and we will discuss about this in later in later topics in this case in turkey it's like outsourcing your refugee camps right instead of having those camps in europe you pay the government of turkey to have them in turkey at a cheaper price, right? The same, uh, they tried it as well in Europe. They tried and they do it in Greece to a certain extent, right? And they tried in many other countries, they tried to offer uh, money for those countries to take up more migrants. But very few European countries accepted to take migrants for such a low price but in turkey they were cheaper and the german government had good relations with turkey they prefer to pay turkey the money 
right? To save to save money instead of paying a higher price to Romania or Poland or uh, Bulgaria or other countries, the Turkish were cheaper, right? And that's why these migrants they 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 are in the refugee camps there in Turkey, right? But what you mentioned as well is will be very interesting for further topics, because who gets the money in Turkey? It's not necessarily the Turkish population. It's not like they throw this money in Turkey with helicopters or the Turkish people. Thanks for hosting the migrants there. It's the government of Turkey, right? And sometimes in some countries, the government needs not be very democratic, right? And the, this money ends up in the hands of the leaders of the country, not in the general population of the country. Spain also pays money to Morocco for taking up migrants. Migrants that come to Spain and they are pushed back into Morocco. And Morocco accepts that. Why? Because the Spanish government pays money to the Moroccan government. Where does this money go to? You think it goes to the Moroccan people, to the ordinary people of Morocco? No. Uh, pro professor, but this is uh, for the rich country, this is a strategy because uh, you can have uh, um, grow up economical. You can grow up economical if you don't have a working force, new working look, force. Look at, for instance, Bogdan and Ailar. Look now at what happens in Belarus. Who the leader of Belarus is? Mr. Right? Alexander Lukashenko. Luka, uh, Lukashenko. Lukashenko. Yeah. Yes. And he is telling the, the European Union that he had an agreement that the European Union gave money to Belarus to make refugee camps there in Belarus. But now after the sanctions, after the elections and the scandals and the sanctions and so on, this agreement with the EU was broken. But Lukashenko also wanted money from the EU, like Turkey or like Morocco, to also host uh, like uh, concentration camps. It's like cons concentration camps for migrants, right? It's a very, very interesting, very interesting topic. Okay. We are running out of time. I need to give you the ordinary points. Yes, before I forget. But I'm very happy with today's course. And I would like to see more of you with the camera turned on. The game that we did today is for you to understand the importance of knowing your colleagues. And for you to understand also how difficult it is for you to know who your colleagues are if you don't see their faces. Now that I see Johan's face for a long period of time with his name and his face over there, it is much easier for me to remember who he is. Or now Moensi now turned on his camera. Now it's easier for me to remember who Moensi is, but for all of you, because we will play this game more times. Yes? And for all of you also, you update your profile with your picture as well. I like very much what Barbara wrote about her in her profile. This is very important for all the colleagues. It's very important for me to know what she studies, what she cares about, that she liked biology and chemistry when she was younger and so, because it makes it's easier for me to know her as a person, right? Not as a number or as a... Understand, Barbara. So thank you for what you wrote 
there on your profile and your colleagues who haven't written about them they should learn from you for instance Haida have you written about you or not I don't know uh, not yet. Not I, I yet. Don't know how. You see how important it is when you log in with your account and you can edit your own profile. This makes it so easier for your colleagues to know you. Understand the difficulty that we have now in this course. We've got students from dozens of different countries here in different continents right we've got students that some of them they have the camera on some of them don't some of them with the mobile phone with good connection bad connection some of them are master students other are first year students second year student it's very difficult to make this course work but what i told you in the beginning you are my army, Kaida. You are the members of my tribe now. And I will not go to war with the other universities with an army of people who do not know the name of their brothers in arms. How can I go to war with you in my army, Kaida? If you do not know the names of the other people, don't see it's impossible for this to work. And my war is my war with Al Hawaiin. It's my war with the University of Manchester, with the war with the Sciences Po, with other universities. We want to be the best. And we can only get this if we are united. Let me give you the points. And don't worry because I speak like this, it looks like I am angry or something. I'm not angry. I'm very happy with the course and everything is everything is good. Everything is all right. But we need to do it better always.